Hello everyone and welcome to another TCG research and development and today we're going to be looking at a very important video, one of my early sources of inspiration, one of my early sources of information. We're going to be taking a look at Mark Rosewater, the lead designer of Magic the Gathering and as people know Magic the Gathering is like the grandfather of all TCGs so what we can learn from his 20 lessons in 20 years can be translated into a lot of our modern day homemade TCGs. It's definitely worth a watch to look at the full format of the video, but if you have the time, I definitely recommend watching this video. The description is going to be a link below, so let's just dive straight in. I've learned a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes, done a few things correct, but I've had a lot of lessons. And so I decided for my first talk ever at GDC, I would share those 20 years lessons that I learned. And I decided I would do 20 lessons. So we had a little uh, mechanic or called um, suspend and suspend basically lets you trade time for money money and magic being mana of course so the idea essentially was normal so when i first saw this i thought what he was going to address was the mistake with extending time because the whole idea of um, a suspend format is that you can play something cheaper but you have to wait for a longer period of time. So I thought, well, there's your mistake because especially with modern day TCGs, people want things like a nice, fast, simple format. You don't want to be counting turns as well because that can, that can complicate things, if you understand what I mean. So you could be playing against somebody and they go, well, it's only been three turns. And you go, well, no, it's been four turns. I'm allowed to play it. No, 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 it's only been three. You can get into arguments that way. So that's what I thought he was going to address but it's not, okay? Normally in Magic, you cast a spell, it happens right away. But Suspend said, well, it's cheaper, but you have to wait s several turns for it. So this is Aaron Ephemeron. It takes four turns once you play it. So you cast it, wait, wait, wait. Okay, you get Aaron Ephemeron. And then as soon as people got it, they would attack with it. In Magic tapping, you, mean, you have to turn it to attack. So they would attack with it. Um, but they weren't allowed to do that because the magic rules say you can't do that. So we were trying to figure out how could we communicate to people not to attack. So we tried a lot of different ways. Um, some got less and less subtle to try to encourage them to say, no, you can't attack. You can't attack with this creature. Um, and in the end, the solution was, no, guys, you can't attack. And then finally we said, okay, you can't attack. We'll change the rules. The rules just say you can attack. You, you want to attack, you can attack. So that brings us to lesson number one. Fighting against human nature is a losing battle. Okay, so some wise words from a wise man. Fighting against human nature is a losing battle. So yes, if, if you're, cre you're creating something and you want it to work a certain way, but the group of people are wanting it to work another way or instinctively, Probably the key word is instinctively. If they are instinctively trying to act in a different way, then sometimes it's better to just go along with that. Now, analyzing the difference between what people are instinctively doing and what people's preconceptions of because perhaps they know another card game. So with Magic the Gathering, you could say, well, with Magic the Gathering, you move in all your units at once and then your opponent decides how they attack. If people are starting your homemade TCG, then perhaps they will instinctively just go, okay, and I attack and they move everything in at once. And you go, whoa, that might not be how it works. You know, there, <laughs> it might be specific targeting, which a lot of other TCGs actually do. So that can be something against what we already know, but it's not exactly human nature. And the nuance is knowing the difference. So one of the classes I took was a class called Aesthetics which is also known as the philosophy of art or the science of beauty. Uh, and the idea of aesthetics is they study how humans perceive the world. You literally study like, how does the brain work? How do the senses work? How do the eyes, the ears, how does it all come together? How do people perceive the things around them? And what they do is they look at all the different qualities that humans cross culture, and they try to figure out what exactly to humans is aesthetically pleasing. And while there's some variance from person to person, they're just things about the way the human brain works that makes certain things more appealing than others. So in your game, players expect the components of the game to have a certain feel. Now, I'm not talking about just visual aesthetics. Magic actually does that pretty well. But I'm talking about 
whether the game component has the right qualities. It, it, it has to feel right. Okay, so what Mark Rosewater actually dives into with this one when he's talking about symmetry and the science of beauty and things like that is that aesthetically things have to fit as well so if the idea is if you say you create a game and you have fire creatures but the fire creatures are very defensive that's gonna go against what people aesthetically are appealing about it or you create fire creatures but they all have a very cold feel you know everything's like blue fire and they all surrounded by ice backgrounds and things like that it's going to clash aesthetically but another thing is sometimes we want these hideous, ugly creatures, but at the same time, there is a, a sense of beauty to it in some way. There is something that is appealing. So even if you take a look at all Dungeons and Dragons designs and things like that, you, you normally find symmetry. Some will lack symmetry, but in a still appeasing way. Say like uh, the gladiator arm. Everybody loves like gladiator army, armor style where they've got the one armored arm. But that isn't um matching you know it's, it's not um it's not symmetrical so why is that appealing to us and then look at that and try to study that and understand what is what is good about that because we see that in crabs as well you know you have the one large claw and the small claw and we copy that design and we introduced it into our own monster designs you know over years like lots of people have adapted that so we need to understand why some aesthetics and some symmetry works and others don't so one of the thing i did very early in this design team is on the whiteboard we wrote up just cool sounding names just things that sounded evocative and then a lot of the cards, a lot of the popular cards from the set came from that whiteboard that we would put things up and we would design to match it. And we ended up with a lot of very evocative cards. Some of the now, this was something that we did with Shard as well. Uh, with the first set, we went with them. Um, we had a lot of preconceptions with um, taking them from like a nice Mars. In the second set, when we're trying to come up with spell names to try and approach it differently, we use this this idea of finding really cool names and then trying to tie card art to those names. So it's sometimes it's just a different step. So you can start off with a name and then come up with the art or you can start off with the art and then decide to name it. And in these different approaches allow creativity to flow a bit better because you're creating new pathways. You can actually find a different way of getting to your goal, getting getting to that end point, the finish line. Favorite cards in the set. And it all came from just matching the idea of what sounded cool? What would make a cool sounding card? So that gets us to lesson number three. Resonan resonance is important. So yes, resonance is important. What you want to do is if you have a certain theme, a certain niche for your TCG, if you're going to go, if you're going to go Lovecraftian and have that sort of sci-fi horror theme, go with that. If you want to go more Lord of the Rings and have have these like horrible orcs and beautiful elves go with that really lean into your theme if you want a little bit of everything then still try to match everything up artistic wise i would say because if you're approaching everything on a larger scale you need something to ground it you need that consistency humans your audience the people who can play your games come preloaded. designers don't have to start from scratch that the audience already has pre-existing emotional responses that the game designer can build upon. For example, Magic didn't invent zombies. Players came to the game with a pre-built emotional relationship with zombies. Okay, what Mark is pointing out there is an excellent point, and this is something I have had to drill into Richard as well. People come with a preconception, they come with a pre-built preconception of what is in a game so yes if you're using zombies you wouldn't name something a zombie and have it be some sort of a uh, flying a uh, bat creature you just wouldn't do it because if i did that and you go oh cool that's a zombie you go that's not a zombie and you would get angry it would make you angry and this is something i've had to approach with a few of his uh, creature designs because he was taking names from certain things i go but this is a known thing this from a certain audience and this will make people angry 
if they don't, if it doesn't fulfill their preconceptions. So this is something that it's been a little bit of a, a fight between Rich and me design wise, but we've always tried to lean into those preconceptions if we're going with certain names. So yes, make use of piggybacking is Mark Rosewater's next lesson where we have to make sure that we are taking what we need if people expect it. So we were doing Odyssey and I said, okay, well, what if I could turn card advantage on its head? So for example, there was a card called Patrol Hound where you could discard a card from your hand to give it an ability. But it didn't matter. You didn't even care what it got. You didn't want the ability. You just wanted to discard cards from your hand. Well, why would you want to do that? So there was a mechanic in the set called Threshold. And what Threshold said is, when you got seven cards in your graveyard, things would change. So for example, the Cross and Beast, which is a 1-1, one, one, became an 8-8. Eight, eight. So the idea was, if you had seven cards in your hand, you could discard them all to the Patrol Hound to give your Croson Beast and make it a 1-1 one, one into an 8-8. Eight, eight. How did that go over with the audience? <laughs> the problem was, yes, you could, you could make them do that, but they didn't want to do that. Okay, so I think Mark Rosewater made an excellent point there. And his next lesson is don't confuse interesting with fun. So yes, the concept is interesting. You know, being able to discard all those to actually create a creature that is so strong. That, that sounds really good on paper. But when you're actually playing the game, you don't want to sacrifice seven cards in your hand to instantly get that creature. You want to play those cards. And it's something that you really have to fight against <laughs> in the sense of, I know when I play Digimon TCG, the purple decks, they love trashing their cards. They love just sending them to the graveyard and it goes against me. I, I feel like I'm going to miss out on some really good cards because they're getting trashed. So. Sometimes it's an interesting one to play with. So just don't confuse interesting with fun. Try to make sure that the interesting part is the fun part. To be successful with your game, you need to know what your audience is trying to experience. What emotional response are you trying to create? In order to know what to put into your game, you have to understand what comes out. So you must continually ask yourself, what impact will this game choice have on the player experience? and it doesn't contribute to the overall experience, it has to go. So the same applies to game design, because everything in the game has to contribute to the emotional output you're trying to create. If not, it has to go. So lesson number six, understand what emotion your game is trying to evoke. So yes, understanding what emotion your game is trying to evoke. I'm pretty sure I was supposed to write emotion there. So understanding what emotion your game is trying to evoke. So this is what I basically was covering with the previous idea of um, trying to stick with a the theme or trying to stick with the right task for your game. If your game is to destroy the opponent, make sure that they are working towards destroying the opponent. If you start creating little side quests for them to go, oh, by the way, do this, this, and this, then it can be a bit confusing. Though in our game, we have rituals, so there are almost like little side quests, it's little, but they're little subtle tasks to, to get to that end goal of actually defeating your opponent. So maybe, maybe, maybe not. It's borderline, I'll say. But just make sure that you remain focused and remember understanding what emotion your game is trying to evoke. Lesson number seven. So this one happened on a plane ride to Gen Con. So that's a big gaming convention. Um, I was seated next to Christopher Rush, uh, who sadly just passed away a few uh, weeks ago. Um, he is a magic illustrator, probably best known for illustrating Black Lotus, one of the most iconic magic cards. Um, also, not a lot of people realize this, but he also did all the mana symbols. So his, his work sticks with us today. So he and I were talking about land. So in, in the game of magic, land's the basic resource. It, it's a pretty boring part of the game in the big picture. It's not where the excitement lies. Um, and Chris came up with a neat idea. He said, what if we took the land, which looked like this at the time, and we made the art real big. And we did something exciting where the art was most of the card. And the rest of the people there said, uh, Chris, no. That, that's not what the land looks like. And who cares? We don't need it. The land's not the exciting part of the game. We don't need to worry about the land. So that story continues with explaining that they eventually did try it. They made the land a little bit bigger. 
people loved it so they made the land bigger people loved it even more so they made the land the full art and then people really dived into that and it's true the, the land is the boring part of the game so what did they do they changed it to make it something that people will fall in love with and this is when we dive into the end of the lesson there which is allow the player's ability to make the game personal so by modifying all the lands and having different art styles or different full art and, and even small art it people were able to personalize their game even more because you gotta remember with a tcg it is about personalizing your own deck it is about that it's not a board game that you just get out and go i'm gonna play this this pre-made character i want i want to make my own deck i want to be creative allow your players to have the tools to be creative dive into those type of concepts if there's something boring about your game see how you can modify it to enhance their creativity and they will probably fall in love with it which actually brings us on to our next lesson the details are where the players fall in love with your game now what mark uses as an example here is a character named uh, fiddle fiddle tip fiddle tip <laughs> it's, it's, it's a funny little anyway it's this little homunculus and then he's showing that people are putting him everywhere in like renaissance paintings and on memes and and making little toys of him and if people love that thing then lean into it you know so the details are where the players fall in love with your game so if there is a small aspect of the game and loads of people find it funny people start making memes of it lean into it more just start adding more to it give the players what they want if that's if that is what they love then why fight against it it kind of it ties into the uh don't fight human nature which was the previous lesson well previous previous pre previous lesson but the current most popular player made format is commander so commander goes back there were a bunch of judges way back when who all day long would judge and when they were done judging they wanted to play magic but they decided to make their own format and so they were inspired by these five elder dragons from a set called legends long ago and so they made a format. Here's how the format works. You choose a legendary creature. You can see that on the card. These represent individual characters. These are specific people. Um, and then they act as the commander for your deck. And you add 99 other cards that match the color of your commander. So if your commander is like green and white, your cards have to be green, white, or green and white. No repeats. So 100 cards, one's your commander, 99 are other cards. They all have to match the color. Um, and Commander was such a popular format that we, back in 2011, made a Commander product. So Commander being the best example there for Mark Rose Wars the next lesson is to allow your players to have a sense of ownership. Now, what, what this is, is if a player takes your game and starts playing with it in a different aspect and it's good and other players actually start latching onto that, then yes, you should lean into that. And it's a it's a player it's a player formed game in that case that doesn't mean that they still can't play your original format but it's just it's giving the players what they want which is a lesson that we just looked at previously so let's say if your players start messing around and you became very angry and was like no that isn't how the game plays you shouldn't do that you and you tell them off for being creative that isn't going to have them coming back to play your game they're not going to go oh okay i'll just play it that way they're going to leave and find another game that gives them that creative outlet they're, they're looking for something more you've gave them the tools you create a tcg a tcg is about forming cards and creating your own patterns for them to come and create their own rules within those patterns isn't that big of a step if you think about it so allow your players to have the sense of ownership let them do what they want with the game watch them they might see something that you haven't seen and they might make your game just that much better and this actually dives straight into the next lesson so leave room for players to explore so the whole idea if if you want your players to be creative is allow them to have that room to explore other formats you know if there's space on the card let them let god let them write on the card if they want to add extra effects so i don't really recommend that but some players might actually do that you know if players want to if players see a gap in the rules and they want to add their own let them do that if players want to try and play a speedy game 
let them do that. If they want to play it like a chess format and put them on like a giant chessboard and move them like pieces, let them do that. Leave room for the players to explore your game. You know, there has to be that sense. It can't be too constricting because if it's too constricting, then you are crushing creativity. And as human beings, we are very creative creatures. We want to know, we want to explore, we want to find new lands and conquer them it's in our nature that's just what we do okay so allow your players to do that yes so what do we do we ask magic players who work at wizards but not in r&d to take a poll and give us their feedback so each card's graded on a scale from one to ten. One means something you would be you don't want to play with 10 you'd be very excited to open it up Okay, then we collect all the data and we use it to figure out which cards we should keep and which cards we should change. Okay, so which is better? A card which receives all sevens or a card with half ones and twos and half nines and tens? I'll give you a second. Which one do you think is better? The second, a card with half ones and twos and half nines and tens. Why? Because we prefer cards that evoke a strong response even if some of that response is negative. Yes, a card that invokes a strong response, even if some of that response is negative. That's an excellent way of phrasing it. So if everyone likes your game, but no one loves it, it will fail. This is the next lesson that Mark was going to address. Yes, yeah, so the idea is create cards that people are going to hate because hatred is a powerful emotion. If people have a hatred for a card, then there is a sense of wanting to defeat the card as well. If your opponent is always using that type of card, you are going to devote more time to find a strategy in defeating that card. You know, so the hate can fuel your audience as well. Obviously, it has to be the right balance, of course. You know, if you make a game where everybody hates all the cards, nobody's going to play it. You have to have the yin and the yang. You have to have the good and the bad you have to have the dark and the light you know it's creating something for everyone essentially but in small aspects of cards rather than trying to combine what everybody loves into one card because if you combine what everybody loves into one card then the aspects aren't strong enough for people to actually fall in love with that card because it doesn't fulfill uh, the need for each individual player it, it fulfills a little bit of the need for every player so they don't love it Lean into the extremes and you will find those extreme fans. So this story goes back to Avison Restored in May of 2012. We made a card called Tybalt. So he was a devil planeswalker. They used like pain magic and a sharp dresser. Um, but we decided that he was only going to cost two mana. Because we had cards, we had four mana, three mana, six mana, five mana. We, we'd done all that. We'd never done a two mana planeswalker. Now, nothing about this being two mana serves the card or the character. We just wanted to see if we could do it. So what happened? So yes, it's an excellent example of don't design to prove you can do something. And I'm not sure if I can describe it better than Mark. So the whole idea is, yes, they've made something cheaper, but then that preconception of if it's cheaper, then it must be terrible. Or the if the powers are slightly diminished, people are going to choose stronger formats because I think you I think you only get one planeswalker in your in your deck. So you, it's a very selective process. So why would you pick a a cheaper, essentially weaker one when you could go with something stronger? So sometimes the, the there's many many factors you know so when you're analyzing one thing and you go hmm that's interesting then maybe it's not the fun which is one of the other less lessons don't mix up the interesting with the fun which dives straight into the next lesson actually which is make the fun part also the correct strategy to win so you don't want people um, milling decks essentially to to make the win though it is something that's in card games and it's kind of hard and grained because if you get to the end of your deck and you can't draw any more cards then it could just be a slow process for your opponent to defeat you so it is normally better to just end the game from that point you know so that naturally becomes a strategy 
but a lot of players will be infuriated by people who try to do deck out strategies. I'm always cautiously interested in it, but I always try to play just the, the regular format. Though it is funny when you see some decks that are designed to mill through their own deck to try and get the right cards actually almost deck themselves out. It always ends up being a fun story. But is that the correct way? Is that the correct strategy? I'll leave you with that question. Lesson number 14. So this is Rise of Eldrazi back in 2010. So obviously it had the Eldrazi in it. These guys were giant and alien and hungry. They were eating the world. So at Common, we made a card called Ulamog's Crusher. So he was giant. He was 8-8, which for a Common is pretty big. He was uh, alien. Look at him. He looks really weird. Also, most magic cards are colored. He was colorless. Um, and he was hungry. He had an ability called Annihilator. And Annihilator had a number. And every time you attacked, your, your opponent had to sacrifice that many things. So Annihilator 2 means every time you attacked, they had to sacrifice two things. So what would happen is we would play this, and we did some play testing, and the players wouldn't attack with him. And we're like, what, what's going on? And what we learned was they were afraid. Here's this awesome creature. They finally got it out. They didn't want something bad to happen to the creature, so they weren't attacking with it. But we knew that attacking with it was really good. How could we educate them? How could we get them to realize they needed to attack with it? Well, the solution was force them to attack with it. So we just said, okay, you have to attack. We put this on the, one of the common cards, and when they attacked, they realized it was good, and they did it more. And so the key was, by forcing their hand, we, we educated them. So lesson number 14, don't be afraid to be blunt. So don't be afraid to be blunt. I think this ties in really well with the make sure that the correct way to win is the is the fun way or the right way. <laughs> They're all starting to blend together in my mind now. So yes, yeah, so sometimes if you're blunt, you can guide the players into the correct way to actually win a game as well. So sometimes it is nice to have effects with nuances and, and little hints to, oh, maybe it works with this other card, but sometimes it's better off just saying, hey, this card targets like red creatures so maybe put in a red deck and people go oh okay you know sometimes it's better to just hold the hand a little bit in some situations so i created something a while back called player psychographics i took an advertising class i told you earlier there's a concept in advertising called psychographics where you're trying to understand the emotional needs of your audience why are they buying your product and so the idea was I created these three psychographics to explain why our players played the game. What emotionally did they get out of the game? So first, there was Timmy or Tammy, there was Johnny or Jenny, and there was Spike. Okay, so Timmy or Tammy wants to experience something. It's very much about the visceral thrill, the, the excitement, or you know, it could be the emotional bonding with friends, but it was about the, how they felt about it, what, how it made them feel. Jenny or Johnny wanted to express something. The game was about showing other people something about themselves through the lens of the game, through their deck, through cool card combos, through some means by which they can express something about themselves. Spikes want to prove something, that the game is a tool to show that they're capable of doing something. Often winning, but that's not the only thing Spike can be focused on. But they use the game as a resource to prove they're capable of doing something. So this is something you've probably heard in a lot of other videos if you've been doing a lot of research for making your own TCG and people will refer to Timmy and Tammy and uh, Johnny and Spike, you know, so so design the components for the audience it's intended for. So it, it, it's going back to what I had previously said is leaning into those extremes because those extremes are what people fall in love with with your game. So the whole idea is uh, Spike wants the everything to be very like um, complex in strategy and very skill based, okay? So you wanna create cards that have that aspect to them that are like, you need you need this card, this card, this card. And if you can put them together, you're a genius, you know? Well done, congratulations, Spike, you're a genius. Where, well, obviously the others like uh, Timmy's more about chance. They want, they want the thrill, they want the dice roll. And if they just happen to get to hit a six out of, of on a six sided dice, they they wipe out Spike's field. Now this is gonna make Spike very angry, you know? So once again, it leans into the other lesson of um, the, the hate and love, doesn't it? So, so Spike will become angry because they're winning through chance, but it's gonna make Timmy very happy because it's, it's, all, it's all 
chance and, and just threw it up in the air and whoa you get the rush you get the thrill because it's the it's the gambling instinct in your mind as well so you get you get that hit of dopamine from that so the whole idea is design the components for the audience it is intended for so you wouldn't create a high skill card with a coin flip in because that wouldn't make the spikes happy you want to focus those aspects onto separate cards so this inspired me to make this card which was well what if it went the opposite direction instead of it being so big that it requires two cards what if it was so small that two of them could fit on one card an invasion back in september 2000 i made this card or a bunch of these cards known as split cards um bill and richard and i we we were steadfast and we slowly convinced everybody that it was the right thing to do and so eventually in invasion the split cards came out what was the player reaction no they loved them they were very very popular um so much so that we've revisited them and done them a, a bunch of different times so le lesson number 16 is be more afraid of boring your players than challenging them so be more afraid of boring your players than challenging them if you're afraid to add something to the game it always worth it's always worth just trying just a little bit just to see how it engages though i would say adding too much all at once is a bit of worrying it is a bit challenging because there was a different interview with mark rose where they were talking about this and their their own r d team when they when they're play testing the new game they found that they could only add one feature per set one new feature per set because uh, it's just with their team there just isn't enough to analyze it to actually make sure that it is working correctly so make sure that you're not overloading yourself in your own play testing trying to add lots and lots of features to make things interesting for your audience when you could do it with just one to tie them over for now let them make sure that you get it right let them enjoy it and then address the next one go slowly in time it always means you have ideas for the future which is also an excellent thing you always know where you're going next and then when people ask you always have a you always have a good answer as well you go well well, here's this, 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 and this, and this. And they go, oh my God, you've got this game mapped out for the next few years. Wow, you're, you're a genius. And you go, yep, I'm just taking my time. You know, I don't want to add everything at once because it'll flood the game. It'll confuse the audience and it could break the game. And that's something we don't want to do. <laughs> so let's look at the back of a magic card. This is what we know as the color wheel or the five colors of magic. So what if we made one small change we thought? What if instead of encouraging players to play as many colors as possible, all five, we encourage them to play as few as possible, two. The reason two and not one is it wouldn't be multicolored if it was one. And when we looked at that with five colors, we realized that there are 10 combinations. So there were 10 two color pairs. So we mapped them and then we made guilds out of them. We gave them each a flavor. Like the Azorius, for example, was all about law and order and control. It was white and blue. It took the elements of white and blue, combined them, and they were the, pe they were the people that made the laws in the world, and they were the bureaucrats. And for each of the, the guilds, we gave them a very specific flavor matching that. And then we took the guilds, and we put them in a city world, and we made Ravnica. What was the player response? They loved it. Ravnica is the most popular world we've ever created. The players just ate it up. So lesson number 17 is you don't have to change much to change everything. So an excellent example, yes. So you don't have to change much to change everything. So take a look at your own game if you've already got one design and just try to think of if you want to add like a, an extra little feature, then just something to add flavor to the game. It can just be these subtle nuances. And like we've learned in previous one, the people love the details. Don't skip out on the details because people fall in love with the small things. So I would also say that expanding the land card art in Magic the Gathering wasn't a huge change. And it and it really made a huge impact on the audience, you know. So it in the terms of the play style, in the terms of how the game plays, it doesn't affect it at all. So you know that it is a safe move to make. And really, there was only going to be a positive because even if people negatively saw it it was always there was always the option for them to use all the land cards they didn't have to use the full art land cards so it when looking back at it i'm sure they were thinking oh my god this this there was no real downside to it yeah people might complain but then you just change it back in the other set and it didn't affect the game so not changing much 
can make a huge impact. It really can. So some weeks are theme weeks. I have to write to a theme. It's goblin week or whatever. I have to write about goblins. Some weeks are open-ended. I can write whatever I want. Which is harder to write? The theme week or the open-ended week? The open-ended week. Because the theme week forced my hand and make me explore options I might not. So which is harder to design? The theme set or the open-ended set? The open-ended set. Because the theme set forced me down paths I might not normally have gone. So what Mark goes on to say is restrictions breed creativity. So the whole idea of if you limit yourself more and more and more, then you are forced to be more creative within that space where if you have everything to expand on in the whole world, it's almost like analysis paralysis. There's too much to take in. So you you don't know what your direction is. And having that, that certain direction, that certain theme, allows your audience to know which direction they're actually going in, which means they can actually decide very fast whether they want to join you on that journey that you're taking when you're designing your game. So yes, restrictions breed creativity. Restrict yourself more and more and just watch it flow. Your audience is good at recognizing problems and bad at solving them. So my metaphor here is a doctor appointment. What does a doctor always do first? They ask how you're feeling because you know better than the doctor how you're feeling. But the doctor doesn't often ask you how to solve the problem because they're better equipped than you to do that. Same is true in game design. Your players have a better understanding of how they feel about your game. You're trying to create an emotional response? Well, they know what that is. They can tell easier when something is wrong and they're excellent at identifying problems. But they're not as equipped to solve those problems. They don't know your tools. They don't know your limitations. They don't know a lot of things they would need to know. And so they're not particularly good at solving problems. So please use your audience as a resource to discover what's wrong, but take it with a grain of salt when they offer solutions. So yes, your audience is good at recognizing problems or bad at solving them. So this was a lesson that I actually delivered in one of my previous Talk TCGs. Um, I'll put a link somewhere for Talk TCG. It'll be in like the, the card section in the top corner up here. Oh, my finger's gone. So I originally was inspired by this phrase, but I reworded, I think, and, and the whole idea was, listen to your audience, but don't follow them blindly. That was, that was my words of advice. So yes, take it in, take what they're saying, but the audience doesn't always know exactly how to fix things. They, they might have a good idea. It's not saying that they're always wrong, but just take everything they say with a pinch of salt because something might be in your game deliberately for design. They might not see that big picture yet. Your audience aren't privy to to the birth of the game they don't know like the long-term direction maybe maybe something is in place because next set you're going to add certain things to it so people go well, why is that there it doesn't help anything you go ah but it's the start it's the seed that has been planted and i must stress again they're really really good at recognizing problems they're a great barometer you should use that as a resource but just take it with a grain of salt the solutions don't always work and what I found was, as you started connecting these different things, they all start coming together. Which is lesson number 20. All the lessons connect. So yes, yeah, so the final lesson, I think is a little bit of a cop out. Uh, all of the lessons connect, okay? So, so yes and... So yes and no, like it, it's a good lesson because it is true. And throughout this video, I've been given examples of, oh yeah, so remember this previous one and it connects to this and you can combine those together. So yes, all of the lessons connect, but is that really a lesson? Is that the 20th lesson? You know, it's that's just, that, it's a nice way of summing up the video. Let's say it that way. You're leaving people with that good feeling. And all the lessons, they do connect. It is true. So there's nothing wrong with that. But I feel like it is more like 19 lessons rather than 20 lessons, if you know what I mean. Because, you, you know, they're all connected through the TCG anyway. So yes, that was Mark Rosewater's 20 years and 20 lessons. I recommend that you watch the full thing. It's fantastic. I've skipped over some bits, but there are some really good bits as well. And, and it's hard to try and compress this video into something that is more digestible for people who want shorter content. But if you've enjoyed it, 
I'll be doing more videos like this. If you've got some recommendations, some other people who are talking about um, TCG design or game design that could relate to TCGs, then let me know because I would love to react to some of those videos and it would be a massive help if you directed me in the right place so I can actually gather this knowledge and do a bit of research and development myself. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I'll see you next time.